Once again, taking your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 3 and Revelation chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Then Revelation 3 and verse 1 through 3. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent, if therefore Thou shalt not watch. I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Yeah. The title of the message this morning is How to Kill a Church Without Trying. How to Kill a Church Without Trying. I noticed, as we talked this morning about the church that's Candy quartered from us over here that their parking lot was full. So apparently the dress code is not important. And I don't know what type of church it is. I don't know what they preach or what they teach or what their doctrine is or anything like that. But it seems like they have a pretty good following. I wonder sometimes when they would look over here and see ours is questioning why are we here? You know, sometimes that would be the question. Why are we here with so few? In view of an introduction to this, Paul is telling us that through the church, God is to get glory. Now, that's not in every religious organization. That's in his church. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. The church was instituted by Christ to further the gospel and to give all glory to God and the Father. But many churches find themselves in the predicament of not growing. As we said this morning, these, these messages are going to go hand in hand as the Lord would have them to do. The Lord wants us to grow. When this happens, many reasons are given and blame is placed on this person and on that person, usually without foundation. It's always come back. You may blame it on that person or maybe blame it on that person. But when it comes to it, it comes right back to you. You're the person. By doing nothing at all, it, a church can commit suicide and kill itself. How can this be? Well, the first point I have this morning is by being delinquent in attendance to its service. We all know Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Thomas missed the first service after Jesus' resurrection. Turn over to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And verse 24. But Thomas... One of the twelve, called Didymus, 
was not with them when Jesus came. So what did he miss? A lot of times, many times, I've thought, oh, if that person would just have been here. If they just could have seen what happened. They could have been part of what transpired here. How much they would have got out of that. But if you look at verses 19 through 21 here, we see the first thing he missed was peace. He said, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. He missed the privilege of fellowship with the master. He missed the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 22. When he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Look what Thomas missed. He missed all that. And so does a delinquent church member miss those things. You never know what's going to happen in the Lord's house on any given Sunday. Many go, but not wholeheartedly. So in a sense, they're still delinquent. We ought to be like David in Psalms 122 and verse 1. He says, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. I think about this every Sunday when I stand back here sometimes and open the door for some. It said in Psalms 84, 10, for a day in the courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wickedness. You ever think about the, those that are delinquent? Where they're at, what they're doing. You ever think about that? Excuse makers kill the church. Excuse is skin of reason stuffed with a lie. Many times there's a lie behind that excuse. John, he had a runny nose. Did it take the whole house to wipe it for him? I'm tired. Jesus got tired too. But did he fail to go to the cross because he was too tired? People can go to work and feel fine, but when time for church, a sudden headache develops. Any reason or excuse is good if you don't want to go. But that's the problem. They don't want to go. Everyone knows on Sunday there is Bible school and worship. In our case, an afternoon service. Everyone knows that. We got signs that say that. It's in the bulletin that says that. It's on our website, it says that. It's on Sermon Audio, it says that. There's no excuse. Everybody knows Sunday what develops and what happens here at what times. It's not a surprise. It's not a shock. Oh, I didn't know you're having services at that time. On Wednesday, there's Bible study and prayer meeting. The times are well known. There is no secret here. 
Jesus' example says go. In Luke 4, 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Paul, when he go into a town, you know what he did? He sought out the place of prayer. Wherever he went, he sought out to where they would be praying. He knew where they were going to be praying. And it wasn't a secret. And that's where he went. Secondly, you can kill a church by indifference to its program. The program of the church is to preach the gospel and start missions. Evangelism and missions. Now, you heard me this morning. I'm not going to rehearse it all. But it doesn't include all that other stuff. It doesn't. You can't do what you need to do here if you're over there. That's why it's so aggravating. Teach them and to then train them to teach others and to grow in the Lord. You got to be here to do that. Bible school, visitation is all part of the program of the church. It takes everyone's cooperation. And if you're not here, then you're not cooperating. God did not save anyone to sit. We are saved to serve no matter what our age or how long we may have served in the past. When I went to Solomon Grace one time, it was a, one of the uh, founding members. And we're at a business meeting, and he says, well, give it to somebody younger. I've done it for too many years. You don't stop serving. If you're fit and you're able, you don't stop serving. It's not a matter of giving somebody else a chance. What are you going to do? See? What are you going to do now that you're not serving? The Christian life is the only one I know where you don't get a vacation. Now, I'm not saying you can't go on vacation, but you shouldn't have a vacation away from the Lord. I asked Brother Cockrell one time, I said, what do you do when you're gone and you're trying to get home on Sunday and you're not at church and you don't know of a church that's close by? What do you do? He said, I pull off the roadside park. He said, I pile out my family. We go over to the picnic table and we open the book. But we have a service. Regardless of where we're at, what we're doing, it's Sunday, it's the Lord's Day, and that's what we're going to do. Now, it don't have to be lengthy. But sometimes should be spent. Well, I'm going on vacation. Where are you going to go to church at? Oh, I wasn't planning on it. <laughs> I mean, that's what we get. I'm taking a break. It's a good thing God doesn't take a break from us. The Christian life should be different than everyone else. Why? Because the enemy never takes a vacation. He is walking around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How do you kill a church without trying? Thirdly, by being insensitive to its needs. Being insensitive to its needs. Ask yourself the question. What if every person here was just like me? You ask yourself this question. What kind of church would this be? 
People seem to think God wants their cast-offs, as we talked this morning. Now, I didn't have time to, to do it this morning, but I did read it. If you think that God wants her cast off, then you need to go in and read the book of Joel and Amos. And you'll see how God feels about that. I believe God wants his house to have everything we have in our home. If it is good enough for us, it is good enough for God. And if it's not, then you shouldn't have it. It shouldn't be there. First Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2 says, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. Paul was telling him, says, I don't want you to just do this because I'm going to be there. This is something you should be doing every single Sunday. Every single Lord's Day, the first day of the week, let everyone lay by him in store. How God has prospered. Has God prospered you? In other words, did you get a paycheck? <laughs> okay, that's what it means. Did you get a paycheck? Then he prospered you. And you're supposed to do something with that. And I'm not going to get into tithing, but you're supposed to do something with that. But you know, I found over the years... First thing that happens when people are trying to leave or decide they want to leave or, you know, they make up their mind when they want to leave. The first thing that happens is the offering box is empty. The first thing that happens. And I could say something here about that. Those who have left and determining where their money should go. But if you're a member of this church, this is where the money should go. Plain and simple. You have no right to tell the church where your money is going to go because you're a member here, see? If you want to send money somewhere else, then you send money somewhere else, but make sure you do what you're supposed to do here first. See, it is personal. It is personal. Let every one of you, that's what Paul says, let every one of you, it is periodical upon the first day of the week. Now, some of us may pay, you know, once a month, twice a month, or once a week, depending on how we get paid. It is proportionate as God hath prospered him. I don't get into your business. I don't know. I should, I won't ever say I don't care, but I would say that be careful because God knows and I have been on that side. You know, I've been on that side. I know what it's like. And I have learned that if you want prosper, then you do what you're supposed to do. Lastly, by being indigenous, meaning well, being indigenous toward church members. In other words, to kill a church, the way to kill a church is to be annoyed or vexed toward other church members. That'll kill a church. If you got an issue, go to the person and have, tell them you got an issue. Don't hold a grudge for 20 years. You know, don't, don't, Look at that person in disgust and hatefulness because something happened 20 years ago. 
And you're going to hold a grudge for that long? You know, I personally, I don't even know how a person can have peace when they do that. I don't know how you can have peace. You've always got that on your mind. Our attitude toward one another is found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, here's the problem. We shouldn't even get to that place. We shouldn't even be getting to the place about giving, forgiving one another. Because if we are kind and tender hearted, shouldn't be no need to forgive, right? Because we all have one goal in common. Be kind to one another. Nothing beats old fashioned kindness. Forgiving one another, not for yourself, for Christ's sake. Forgive one another. Matthew 6, 15. Some people need to go here and read this over and over and over. They need to get this in their head. It says in Matthew 6, 15. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Of course, we have that. I just heard some the other day say this. Well, I can forgive them, but I can't forget it. Well, you're not forgiving them. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, you're not forgiving them. You can't forget it. And let me tell you, from experience, Satan's not going to ever let it go. So you have to be bigger than that and let it go. And I can't tell you how much... How much on a daily basis, I have to tell myself, let it go. Just let it go. I can't change it. Just let it go. The only person that can change it is God. I can't do it myself. I'd like to, but the way I would handle it would be a little different than the way God handles it. Mark 11, 25 and 26. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have aught against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. That's scary stuff. Do we want God to forgive us of our trespasses? Well, absolutely. Then we need to stop and forgive. As hard as it may be. Matthew 18, 21 and 22. And I always like this verse of scripture because the way the Lord describes it to Peter. Then came Peter to him, to the Lord, and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times times seven. You know what that means? Infinity. Always. And then the verse goes on and says, if he comes and sins the same sin in an hour, you're supposed to forgive him. If he does it seven times in a day, you're to forgive him. If he asks forgiveness. It's pretty hard to forgive somebody if they're not going to ask. I mean, we can... Okay, Lord, he, they did this against me. I'm going to try to forgive them, even though they didn't come and ask. I think a person needs to ask forgiveness to receive forgiveness. I mean, I just don't expect Christ to forgive me and not ask him. So our aim ought to be the building up the body of Christ. This church is the body of Christ. We are members in particular. Making up the body with Christ being the head. So an unforgiving spirit is a bitter spirit 
by not being identified with its fellowship. That'll kill a church. Because if you're identified with an unforgiving spirit or bitter spirit, there's a problem. If you can't have peace in the church because of this, then how do you expect the church to have peace? See, there's always going to be that turmoil. And many people don't realize it, but we all feel that. We all feel that tension. There are a lot of church drifters, changers. There will always be. They want to change things. They want to change how we do things because they think it's a better way. But the problem is that they think it's a better way, but it's not. We do it the way God wants us to do it. We won't get in trouble that way. What does the Bible say? What does the, What is our, our forefathers that have been doing this for hundreds of years? What do they say? How they've been doing things that's worked back, it worked back then. Why wouldn't it work today? But they don't want to do it that way. There are two things that must happen before a person can become a church member. And I think sometimes we overlook this. I mean, it's pretty bad, and I know this has happened, but it's pretty bad when you're going to go to ordain a man that's going to be that says he's called to the ministry, and you're going to ordain that man. And he doesn't answer the questions to your satisfaction and use the excuse, well, the church already had this, all the food and everything prepared and, and we had to go through with it. No, 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 no. I think you're going to be held accountable for that. If you're on the presbytery and you say that, and I had him say it to me, why did you ordain? Why did you recommend this person to be ordained? Well, they already had, the church already had everything prepared So you let this guy loose out into the, the world. That don't even make sense, folks. But I've, it's happened. Romans 10. I'm in John. What am I doing in John? Romans 10. And I know you all know this. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So two things must happen. The person has to be saved. Then that person must be scriptural baptized into the church. Now, that doesn't change their salvation. If they're saved, they're saved. But what it does is there's a lot of folks walking around there that don't have church membership. True church membership. I hear this all the time. Well, they need to be rebaptized. No, it's not rebaptized. They need to be baptized because the church is the only church that has the authority to baptize. So they never were baptized. So it's not another baptism, it's the only baptism. People's language anymore when it comes to the church is just like, you don't know what you're saying. When a church baptizes an individual, they have, they have counseled with that person, or they should have counseled with that person, and told them that not only does baptism fulfill the command of Christ, but also places us in the local body in which the that Christ is the head. And I just stated that to you. And Paul says we're members in particular. And he starts naming them all. The eye, the nose, whatever. You know, you're sitting there. And all the members are here. So if one of you are gone. Then we're missing something. Finger, an eye, a leg, a foot. See, we're missing that. Because you're part of the body. You're a member in particular. So if you go to church and are not a member of it, what is wrong? See, what's wrong with that picture? You're going there, but you're not a member. 
Are you ashamed of it? If you are, you ought to go somewhere else where you can be proud of the church you attend. That only makes sense, right? In conclusion, yes, by simply doing nothing and expecting someone else to do all the work, allowing attitudes to stagnate, relationships to dwindle, not supporting, supporting her, the church will surely die. Thank God she won't lay down and die. She will have to be killed. But by passively going our own way, we are actively killing the church. The church, the body of Christ, will never die, but the local parts of that body can die. I have seen it happen, and the people give up or are too stubborn to change. We know what we believe. We don't have to some, have somebody come in here and tell us what we should believe. <laughs> you know, We know what we believe. If you want to be a part of that, we welcome you with open arms. You want to come in here and try to change our doctrine, then there's the door. It's that simple. So question, what is going to happen to our church? Are we going to let her die for lack of support and uplifting? Jesus expects us to each do our part for him. May God bless his word to your heart.